Right on. Thank you all for uh, coming to this terrific conference. Thanks for bringing me out to Vermont. I haven't been to Vermont this time of year, so that's terrific. My name is Yaron Bauman. I appear before you today, ladies and gentlemen, as the world's first and only stand-up economist. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's, uh, it's a niche. It's too late, sir. It's too late. Uh, I really only have one thing going for me as a stand-up economist, and that's low expectations. Uh, you know, when I uh, told my father that I was going to be a stand-up economist, he said, Yoram, you said you can't be a stand-up economist. And I said, why not? And he said, because there's no demand. <laughs> See, I'm winning their hearts and minds already. Uh, I said, don't worry, Dad, I'm a supply-side economist. <laughs> I just stand up and let the jokes trickle down. Uh, I believe in the Laffer curve. Uh, that's actually just my joke to test how much economics you all know, and then I kind of arrange the rest of the routine accordingly. Uh, I'm giving you all about a six. Uh, you know, when, uh, when I was invited to come and join you today, pretty much the only instructions that I received, uh, uh, and I received these instructions all the time as a stand-up comedian, uh, it was that I should try not to offend anybody. So I figured I would start with some jokes about politics. Uh, now, I like to tell jokes about politics that appeal to people across the political spectrum. I get the sense that might be a difficult thing to do in this crowd. Uh, I don't know how much of a political spectrum there is, but it's okay. I'm actually going to do the same thing with you that I do with like lefty crowds that I talk with in, my, uh, in Seattle where I live or my hometown of San Francisco. The same material that I do when I you know, talk to trucking executives on the banks of the Arkansas River. That was a story. Uh, I'm going to divide you up across the political spectrum, right? So this is audience participation. So the way most people think about politics is left wing or right wing. So I'm going to divide you up right down the middle here. And for the next couple of minutes, audience participation, you folks are here on my left. For the next couple of minutes, on my left, for the next couple of minutes, you get to represent the left wing of the American political spectrum. All right. <laughs> that, that was actually an appropriate amount of enthusiasm for the left wing of the American political spectrum. All right, now you folks here on the right, come on, I need you all to come through for me. You all on my right wing. Yeah. You need to work on that a little bit more. Uh, when I did this in Texas last month, they started chanting USA. I want you that for me. Come on, you all on my right wing. Come on, you, 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 yeah. That was pretty pathetic right wing. But some of you tried. You folks are here on the left, though. You all were perfect. No, because while the right wing was chanting USA, you were just sitting there looking befuddled and vaguely unpatriotic. Uh, now, that's how most people think about politics is left wing and right wing. But if you think about economics or political science, what we call median voter theory, that actually leaves out the most important part of the American political spectrum. The left wing is actually over here. And the right wing is over there. And you all in the middle, this room is perfect, you all in the middle, you all are the most important part of the American political spectrum. You all are my swing voters. Too much enthusiasm, ma'am, calm down. Uh, now, a couple of very important things about swing voters, right? First of all, in America, there are a lot of swing voters. All right, if you are not a communist, or a fascist, then you are probably a swing voter. And if you do not know the difference between communists and fascists, then you are definitely a swing voter. Uh, now your job, swing voters, when it comes to politics and current events, extremely important swing voters, your job is to pay absolutely no attention whatsoever. And then every four years, you determine the fate of the free world. I, I know that sounds like a big responsibility, but trust me, don't give it a second thought. And that's really how the political spectrum is divided. You got the left wing. The stereotype about the left wing is that the left wing is spineless. <laughs> See, they just take it. They're like, yeah, we're spineless. <laughs> Very good left wing. You're doing great. You got the left wing is spineless. You got the right wing. The right wing is heartless. And you got the center. The center is clueless. And clueless and apathetic. You're so clueless, you don't know what apathetic means. You're so apathetic, you can't be bothered to look it up. <laughs> I will explain that joke to you later, sir. 
Uh, now, there are also, of course, the uh, extremes of the American political spectrum, the far right of the American political spectrum, folks against the, uh, uh, kind of against the aisle way there, and the far right, you all, and the far right of the American political spectrum, you all get to be my libertarians. That's cool, you can do what you want. Uh, far left of the American political spectrum, folks against the aisle over here on the far left, you all on the far left get to be my libertarians. Uh, I'm seeing confused looks from the swing voters. No, no, I had someone sitting in the middle once who was like, libertarians? You mean the people that check books out for me? And I had to clarify that libertarians are freedom lovers. Right, they come in two flavors. You got right-wing libertarians. They want everybody to be free to use guns. You've got left-wing libertarians. They want everybody to be free to use drugs. You can move if you'd like, sir. Uh, now, now, both wings of the Libertarian Party want to abolish Social Security and Medicare, right, which I think makes total sense, all right? Because who's going to make it to 65? when the world is full of meth fiends with machine guns. Uh, many people are actually surprised that the uh, libertarians are the far right of the American political spectrum. They expect the Tea Party to be the far right of the American political spectrum. But the Tea Party is actually back that way in kind of deep right center field. The Tea Party is this mix of the far right and the deep center, this explosive combination of radical individualism and extreme cluelessness. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 these are people who believe in social Darwinism, but don't believe in Darwin. It's all right, I'll come back to you, left wing. Uh, I was actually, I was, I was in Mississippi not too long ago giving a talk, and there were a bunch of Tea Party folks there, so I got a chance to talk to them, and I said, look, I said, I can tell that you're angry. You know, why are you so angry? And this guy jumped up, and he said, it's the gays. And I said, well, what's wrong with the gays? And, and he said, they're breeding like rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> you can't win that argument. Uh, anyway, there's the Tea Party in deep right center field. I would make a similar jokes about Occupy Wall Street, which is in deep left center field. But you are not allowed to make fun of the dead. Um, Oh no, <laughs> I've offended the left wing. Uh, I'm very sorry, left wing. I apologize. I will make it up to you later at the drum circle. Uh, right wing, I'll explain to you later what a drum circle is. Uh, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about politics lately because uh, I went to China not too long ago and it was my first time in China. And I really didn't know what to expect, and I wanted to have something to say in case the Chinese people came up to me and said, you know, like, tell me about democracy. Uh, that didn't happen. And instead, I went to China, and the Chinese people came up to me, and they said, tell me about your budget deficits. And I had to say, let me tell you about democracy. I know when it comes to the budget deficit, the left blames the right, and the right blames the left, but I actually blame the center. I don't think we have a budget deficit because left-wing people believe in mandates or because right-wing people believe in markets. I think we have a budget deficit because people in the middle believe in magic. No, 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 let me explain, all right? Every time a left-wing politician says, hey, I've got a great idea for a road or a school or a hospital, the response from swing voters is like, oh, yeah, let's do that. Right? And then every time a right-wing politician says taxes are too high and we should cut taxes, the response from swing voters is like, yeah, let's do that. And then it turns out we have a budget deficit, and swing voters blame the politicians, which is kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, this is kind of like going to the doctor for your checkup, and the doctor tells you that you've been putting on weight, and the left side of your brain says, huh, I guess I better exercise more. And the right side of your brain says, huh, I guess I better stop eating so many donuts. And the middle part of your brain says, huh, I guess I better get a new doctor. <laughs> Then the tea party busts into your hospital room, jumps up on the crazy chair, and they're like, I know how you can cut your weight in half. You know, you don't need to exercise more. You don't need to stop eating donuts. And you're like, what gives you the right to interrupt my doctor's appointment? And they're like, the First Amendment. <laughs> how did you even get past hospital security? The Second Amendment. <laughs> All right, smarty pants, what's the Third Amendment? I don't know. 
Nobody remembers the Third Amendment. I don't know, but I know how you can cut your weight in half. You don't need to exercise more. You don't need to stop eating donuts. You just need to use the metric system. <laughs> that was actually the best response I've ever gotten to that joke. Usually that joke doesn't work, and let me tell you why. Uh, first of all, let's just be honest, right? The joke makes no sense, right? Because the Tea Party would never endorse the metric system. Uh, and secondly, in order to understand the joke, you have to know that like 300 pounds is only 150 kilos, right? Which means that the joke pretty much only makes sense to scientists, Canadians, and drug dealers. <laughs> so I want you to look around at the people that laughed at that joke. And if they're not scientists or Canadians, Well, that's all I'm saying. That's my little political bit. Before we go any further, I should show you my T-shirt. This is my uh, <coughs> this is my Enjoy Capitalism T-shirt. Uh, made in China. If you look at the tag on the back, it was actually made out of 80% cotton and 20% irony. So, dry, clean only. Uh, people sometimes ask me where they can buy this T-shirt, and I actually can't tell you because. Um, I contacted the folks who, who uh, you know, make these t-shirts and I said, look, I have this website, standupeconomist.com, it gets a fair amount of traffic, how about if I post the t-shirt on my website and, and, and you know, I get a cut of the proceeds. And they wrote back and they said that they weren't interested. Uh, from which I can only conclude that these people love capitalism, they're just not very good at it. Uh, so I can't tell you where the t-shirt came from. Um, many people wonder how I got a, a start doing uh, stand-up comedy about economics for a living. And uh, I got started with this next little bit that I'm going to share with you. Uh, so this is Mankiw's Principles of Economics translated. So for those of you who don't know, Greg Mankiw, Harvard professor, wrote one of the best-selling economics textbooks in the country. And it's based on these 10 principles of economics. Now, I know that there's a lot on the screen but I generally encourage people not, even to, not to even try to read these. Just take my word that you pretty much need a PhD in economics to understand these 10 principles. Now fortunately, I have a PhD in economics, so I've taken it upon myself to translate these 10 principles for the uh, more fortunate folks in the world. We're going to begin by separating them into the first uh, seven principles, which are microeconomics, and the last three, which are macroeconomics. The difference, as P.J. O'Rourke once said, being that microeconomists are wrong about little things, <laughs> and macroeconomists are wrong about things in general. Uh, we are going to begin with the macro principles 8, 9, and 10. Now, believe it or not, these all have the exact same translation, namely blah, blah, blah. Uh, as proof, I need only remind you that macroeconomists have successfully predicted nine out of the last five recessions. And as further proof, we can now go up one font size. Uh, so let's go back to the micro principles. Now, the first one, people face trade-offs. This is really one of the most fundamental ideas in economics. And the translation is very simple. Choices are bad. Okay. Now, this is actually a simple syllogism, right? I mean, trade-offs are bad. Anytime you have choices, you have trade-offs. Therefore, choices have to be bad. If you don't understand that, take a look at the second principle. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. Translation choices are really bad. Now, I have a simple demonstration of this fact. Let's say that someone offers you a Snickers bar that you value at a dollar. All right, then what you can loosely think of as your economic profit in this situation is the dollar of the Snickers bar minus the cost which you give up to get it, which is nothing. Your economic profit is, don't all answer at once, a dollar. Thank you, sir. A dollar. Now, to begin to understand why choices are mad, bad, imagine someone offers you a choice between the Snickers bar that you valued a dollar and some M&Ms that you valued 70 cents. Okay, now your economic profit is the dollar minus the 70 cents, only 30 cents. You begin to understand why choices are bad. The worst possible situation, in fact, is being offered a choice between a Snickers bar and an identical Snickers bar because then your economic profit is zero. All right, now, people who are not trained in economics might say that that's no different than just being offered one Snickers bar, but that kind of sloppy thinking will never get you a tenure track position. <laughs> All 
You know, I occasionally get emails from econ faculty members who are like, that thing with the Snickers bar is great. I'm going to put it on the final exam and ask the students to explain what's wrong with it. And then they always email me back like a week later and say that they didn't do it because they couldn't figure out the answer. Uh, in any case, choices are bad. Choices are really bad. I'm not going to beat around the bush with you folks. If you don't understand why choices are bad, you're probably stupid. <laughs> Moving on. Principle number three, rational people think of the margin. Translation, people are stupid. Right. Now it is immediately obvious to the most casual observer with the meanest intelligence that people do not think at the margin. Nobody goes to the grocery store and says, I'm going to buy an orange. I'm going to buy another orange. I'm going to buy another orange. That joke only makes sense to econ majors. People don't think like that. Right? But if people don't think at the margin, and if, as Mankiw says, rational people do think at the margin, we are led to a most unhappy conclusion. People are not rational. People, in other words, are stupid. But before you despair for humanity, take a look at the next principle. Principle four, people respond to incentives. Now, the dictionary says that incentives is a noun. It's a synonym for motive. So when Mankiw says that people respond to incentives, what he's saying is that people are motivated by motives. <laughs> You may think this is a bit like saying that tautologies are tautological, right? I mean, people would have to be pretty stupid to be unmotivated by motives. But remember principle three. Right? People are stupid. Hence the need for principle four to tell us that people aren't that stupid. All right, moving on to every economist's favorite topic. Free trade, principle five, trade can make everyone better off. Translation, trade can make everyone worse off. Now you may wonder how the translation of principle five is the opposite of the principle itself. I have a simple proof of this fact that will blow your mind. I want you to compare two statements. One of them is trade can make everyone better off. And the other one is trade will make everyone better off. Now if you had to pick one of those two statements to put in your best-selling economics textbook, right, it's no contest. Statement two is clearly stronger. But Mankiw uses statement number one instead. And if you think about why, there's only one possible explanation. Statement number two has got to be wrong. In other words, trade can make some people worse off, and from there it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to trade can make everyone worse off. Now I figured that some of you have some questions about this, so I added a footnote with some details. Eat your heart out. <laughs> now that we've cleared that up, I want you to see the last two principles. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Translation, governments are stupid. And governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Translation, governments aren't that stupid. Right, follow immediately from principle five and its translation. Right, if trade can make everyone worse off, then, excuse me, if trade can make everyone better off, what the heck do we need government for? Right, just let people trade. Okay, governments are stupid. But if trade can make everyone worse off, we better have a government around to stop people from trading. So there are the 10 principles of economics translated. Much better than what we started with, I hope you'll agree. And what I want you to notice here is how subtle economics is. All right, people are stupid, but they're not that stupid. Governments are stupid, but they're not that stupid. The only thing that's not subtle in economics is that choices are always really, really bad. So I filmed this a, a, a couple years ago, put a video up on my website and on YouTube, uh, not thinking all that much of it. And I'm a, a little embarrassed to say that it's now past a million hits on YouTube, which is a lot for economics jokes. <laughs> not a lot for videos about like puppies. Uh, but it's a lot for economics jokes. And many of those hits are because the video was posted on Greg Mankiw's blog. It turns out that he's a fan of my parody. Either that or else he comes from the school of there's no such thing as bad publicity. Uh, and in fact, I got to perform in his class at Harvard. Uh, it was actually the last leg of my 2008 supply side world tour, uh, which, was, which was mostly a trip to Israel with my father. Uh, but as long as I was there, I did some comedy in Europe, and then I stopped off at Harvard on my way home. Originally, he wasn't going to tell his students I was coming. He just said there was a surprise guest who was coming to class. Uh, but then he had to tell them that I was coming because some students went to his office hours and said there was a rumor going around the Harvard campus that Ben Bernanke was coming to class. Uh, 
I'd like to think they got the better end of the deal. Uh, in, in any case, although Bernanke was funny on Colbert last night, uh, in any case, one of, the, one of the great things about YouTube is that not only do a lot of people waste a lot of time looking at videos on YouTube, uh, a significant fraction of those people waste even more time commenting <laughs> on videos on YouTube. Uh, and I want to share with you some of my favorites because these are not actually funnier than the video itself. Uh, starting with someone with the screen name of Coolway, and Coolway writes, uh, I can't tell whether this video is supposed to be funny or educational. Uh, choices are bad. Uh, Runner-up comments, you're funny, and I don't say that to a lot of people. Lots of people are not funny. Lots of people are sad. I like to think that I'm doing something new in the world by doing stand-up comedy about economics. Apparently not. The next person writes, a Jew who's an economist and a stand-up comedian? You can't get any more stereotypical than that. <laughs> Every time I see this, I'm reminded of what my father actually said when I told him that I was going to do stand-up comedy. So what you need to know about my father, my father's a first-generation American. He's sort of divorced from popular culture like he's never owned a television. And so when I told him I was going to do stand-up comedy, he said, Yoram, he said, be reasonable. You know, give me the name of a single Jew who's ever made it in stand-up comedy. <laughs> Sometimes people come up to me after my talks and they're really mad and they're like, what about Seinfeld? And I'm like, oh, I know. I'm like, tell my father. And my father will say, who's Seinfeld? Uh, the other thing this reminds me of is I did a show a couple years ago. This was in a, a, a northern Michigan. This is a little resort. I spent the night. I had breakfast. There was an item on the breakfast menu called the L'Chaim breakfast bagel. And the L'Chaim breakfast bagel in Thompsonville, Michigan came with your choice of smoked ham <laughs> or crispy bacon. Uh, apparently, apparently no Jews in northern Michigan. Uh, the man in the video is the most stupid man in the world. This is <laughs> extremely impressive given the competition. Uh, not everybody's a fan of the video. The next person writes, uh, I spaced off listening to this just like in my real economics class. <laughs> and then there are the crazy people, like the guy who writes, uh, they make economics boring and confusing on purpose because they don't want you to figure out that the whole economy is a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> Uh, this person gets bonus points for creating a new word. Uh, un unpurpose. Unpurpose. You may have a purpose, but do you have an unpurpose? Uh, now, this is not the craziest thing that somebody wrote. The craziest thing somebody wrote was this. Uh, what a confusion of deceptions. The U.S. Congress does not print money as the Constitution dictates. That power was usurped by a cabal of international banksters in 1913. <laughs> Yes, um, I know. Uh, banksters. Uh, at first I thought this was a typo, uh, and then my wife informed me that banksters equals bankers plus gangsters. Yes, this is the financial mafia. Right, you got the Italian mafia. The Italian mafia makes you offers that you can't refuse. And you've got the financial mafia. The financial mafia makes you offers that you can't understand. <laughs> Uh, I finally understood this person was talking about the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States created in 1913, but only because the next thing that they write is that the Federal Reserve is about as federal as Federal Express. Uh, I honestly have no idea what that means, but I'm pretty sure this guy voted for Ron Paul. Uh, so after this guy writes this nasty stuff about the Federal Reserve, you know, Federal Reserve and, you know, Janet Yellen, the new chair of the Fed, generally recognized as like the second most powerful person in the U.S. government after the president. And after this person writes this nasty stuff about the Fed, somebody else feels compelled to come to the defense of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States on my YouTube comments page. <laughs> so here's what the next person writes, you know, in defense of the Fed, if we got rid of it, we need to replace it with something else that does this, you know, that, that does, does its functions, i.e. printing money and clearing checks. Okay, the first of those printing money, the Fed doesn't actually do that. The Treasury does that. Clearing checks is a very minor role that the Fed has. 
So somebody else has to write in and correct this person, actually say like, you know, the Fed doesn't print money. And this is like an A plus answer. The Fed controls the money supply by expanding and contracting bank reserves. And then the first person writes back in and says, oh yeah, that's right, thanks. <laughs> So now we're getting like edumacation on the YouTube comments page, uh, which is always nice to see. Uh, not all exchanges are this nice. One person just writes in and says, translate? So somebody takes the bait and says, he's poking fun at microeconomics. And the first person writes back and says, yeah, but translate, you jerk. Uh, I've cleaned up the language. Second person writes back and says, that was a translation. You should probably stick to entertaining yourself with less intellectually demanding material. Uh, not the meanest exchange on YouTube. The meanest exchange on YouTube starts with somebody who writes, uh, this video rules. By the way, I'm not an economist. I switched my major, which compels somebody else to write back and say, thanks for keeping us updated. Let us know when you drop out altogether and devote your life to smoking crack. <laughs> Kids these days. At this point, you're probably wondering why I am keynoting the, the Renewable Energy Vermont Conference. It's because of this slide. I want to come back to this slide here because this example in this footnote is actually a real example. Right? Economists, we spend a lot of time talking about how trade can make lots of people, sometimes everybody, better off. But it's actually possible, at least in theory, to have a situation where trade makes everybody worse off. And since this relates to the serious economics work that I do, when I do serious economics, I work on climate change and carbon taxes and things like that. I want to talk you through this example real quick. So I'm going to tell you a made up story about these three people. We're just going to call them orange, pink, and blue. And uh, orange, pink, and blue, what's their deal? Orange, pink, and blue live in a small town. The small town has an air pollution problem. So think Beijing, <laughs> but with only three people. Okay, because models are simplifications of reality. And each of these three people, they each have a garage that's full of stuff that they don't use. All right, so now we're going to see some trades. So first, Orange is going to sell a lawnmower to Pink. And the story I'm going to tell you is that Orange is not using the lawnmower. She sells it to Pink for 100 bucks. Pink will be willing to pay $200 for a lawnmower. So they each get $100 in net benefits, right? Orange sells his lawnmower for 100 bucks that she's not using. Uh, Pink would be willing to pay $200 for a lawnmower. She only has to pay $100, so she gets $100 in net benefits. So far, so good. But when Pink starts using this lawnmower, lawnmowers create a little bit of air pollution. Maybe we can see a little bit of haze around this town. All right, and like I said, made up economic story. Maybe we can monetize the health impacts from asthma, missed days of work in school, all that sort of stuff. Maybe we can monetize those health impacts at $80 per person. All right, not just for orange and pink, but also for blue. So the impact on blue is what economists call a, a negative externality, right? But note that because blue is external to this trade between orange and pink, but note that orange and pink each get $20 in net benefits from that trade. They may not know about blue. They may not care about blue. So that trade might well still make sense to them. So I'm going to tell you a very similar story about pink, who is going to sell a, a motorcycle to blue. They each get $100 in benefits. Pink from selling this motorcycle that she's not using for $100. Bucks. Blue would be willing to pay $200 for a motorcycle. I guess it's not a very good motorcycle. She only has to pay $100. But when Blue starts using the motorcycle, motorcycles create a little bit of air pollution also. All right, air pollution gets worse. An additional $80 in healthcare costs for everybody. All right, and now you just complete the circle. All right, blue is going to sell a chainsaw to Orange. Don't ask why. They each get $100 in benefits. Air pollution gets worse. Another $80 in healthcare costs for everybody. All right, and now if you just add up any one of these columns, Right, you see that after all three of those trades together, everybody ends up at minus 40. I do a lot of college shows, and I get all sorts of answers to that question, like zero, uh, minus 100. Uh, math is hard. Uh, <laughs> minus 40. So this is the tragedy of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma, if you're familiar with those ideas. Right, but the economics of this is that each person's trades are individually rational. If you ask any of these people if they want to take back any of the trades that they made, they'll say no because each trade they make leaves them $20 better off. Right? But altogether, the trades end up hurting everybody. 
If you want to belabor the point and make connection to climate change, you could, I don't know, like label the people. <laughs> and this is in very broad strokes why economists are concerned about climate change. So uh, as I may have mentioned earlier, I actually make a living doing stand-up comedy about economics, uh, much to the chagrin of my father. Mostly I do colleges and corporate events, and the corporate events I speak with are, are um, not always as friendly as this crowd might be toward climate issues. You know, it's like the Florida Bankers Association and the Barry Goldwater Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and, and trucking executives on the banks of the Arkansas River. So I'm actually just going to share with you the same little uh, uh, climate change pitch that I share with them. One of the things that I've learned from the 10 or so years I've been doing comedy is that if you make people laugh for 45 minutes, then you can talk to them about pretty much anything you want for five or 10 minutes and they will give you the time of day. They may not end up agreeing with you, but they'll give you the time of day. So I talk about climate change and revenue neutral carbon taxes and the idea that there's kind of a market friendly bipartisan way forward on dealing with climate change. So I'm gonna give you the same little pitch that I give them uh, and, and forgive me because I'm sure that, that you all know this already, but right, we start out with this fact that carbon concentrations in the atmosphere are going up. Nobody really doubts that this is primarily caused by human activity, right? Burning fossil fuels and deforestation. Then we have this theory that says that if carbon concentrations go up, then global temperatures are going to go up. This theory actually predates Al Gore. <laughs> they laughed at that joke more in Texas. Uh, it goes all the way back to this fellow, Arrhenius, who is a chemist in Sweden. And in 1896, 1896, he made the first estimate of how much global temperatures would increase if we doubled CO2 in the atmosphere, which we're on track to do kind of the middle of this century. And his, uh, his estimate from 1896, about five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit, is still pretty close to the range that climate scientists talk about today. The big difference between where he was then and where we are now is that he thought that climate change was going to be awesome because he lived in Sweden. Uh, and we tend to have a little more concerns about changing the basic functionings of planet Earth in any case, we've been running this experiment on planet Earth for the last 150 years or so, and here are the results of the experiment. The blue dots there are individual years. The red bars are 10-year average temperatures from the 1880s up to the 1970s. And then there's the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, for what it's worth the first few years of this decade. Temperatures, I would argue, going up pretty much in line with the projections of climate science. Now. If you happen to not believe that humans are partly responsible for increasing global temperatures, I will try to find common ground with you anyway. And the common ground comes from the way that economists think about pollution problems, which is that the way to get less pollution is to make polluting expensive. Because right? when you make polluting expensive, you get market forces working to promote conservation and innovation and development of new technologies and all the things that I at least love about capitalism. So what I work on as an environmental economist is using the tools of economics and the power of capitalism to protect the environment. Tools of economics, power of capitalism, protect the environment. A couple of policy tools to talk about, like a carbon tax or an auction cap and trade system, but the point of those policy tools is to drive up the price of fossil fuels. Now this is generally the part in my talk where people stop laughing because it's hard to convince people that we should be paying more for gasoline and electricity and things like that. But there is a side benefit to these policies other than the main benefit of, you know, potentially saving the world. <laughs> and the side benefit is that if you do these policies right, you generate a pile of revenue. Right? Government can do all sorts of things with that revenue, but the idea that I work on and talk to folks about is that we could be using most or all of that revenue to reduce or eliminate existing taxes. So it's called environmental tax reform or tax shifting or revenue neutral tax swaps. Right? The idea being that if we had higher taxes on things we want less of, like pollution, then we could afford to have lower taxes on things we want more of, like jobs and income and savings and investment. And this is where I find common ground, even with folks like uh, George Will, uh, the columnist for the Washington Post, pretty conservative fellow. He came to one of my classes a few years ago. He doesn't believe that humans are partly responsible for increasing global temperatures, but I asked him if he would support replacing part of the payroll tax part of the employment tax in this country with a carbon tax. And he said that he was all for it because he hates the payroll tax. <laughs> and at the time, unemployment was 8.5%. It's now still too high in my view. I hate the payroll tax. Right? And Al Gore hates the payroll tax. Al Gore says we should tax what we burn and not what we earn. So I asked George Will what he thought about the fact that he and Al Gore agreed on this particular issue. 
And George Will said, well, he said, an idea should not be held responsible for the people who believe in it. <laughs> in any case, economists across the political spectrum think this is a pretty good idea, like from Paul Krugman on the left to both of Mitt Romney's chief economic advisors on the right. And there's even a place that's done this. Right? So in the eyes of many economists, the best climate policy in the world, I live in Seattle, just to our north, the Canadian province of British Columbia, has what many economists can consider to be the best climate policy in the world. Implemented by a right of center government in 2008 that said, look, we want to do something about climate change. We want to be market friendly. We don't want to grow government because that's our political philosophy. So they implemented a revenue neutral carbon tax. So here's basically how it works is they have a carbon tax of $30 per ton of CO2. So to put that in context, $30 per ton of CO2 is about 30 cents a gallon of gasoline. It's about three cents a kilowatt hour of coal-fired power, about half that for natural gas, uh, 15 cents a therm, $1.50 million BTU. Right? So uh, that's not nothing. So $30 per ton of CO2 carbon tax. And then all the revenue from the carbon tax, in fact, a little bit more than all the revenue from the carbon tax, goes to reduce personal and corporate income taxes in the province of British Columbia. There's a little offset for rural households. There's a bigger offset for low-income households. In my view, at least, in the eyes of many other economists, uh, it's super smart policy. It's not all that often in the world that, that economists see policies enacted that actually match up pretty closely to what we might find in an environmental economics textbook. And this is, this is a, a case where it's happened. Okay. Uh, that policy went into effect in 2008. So we actually we can see how it's, how it's worked since then. So first of all, we can look at carbon emissions. So here's petroleum sales. BC is in green. Canada as a whole is in blue. This is relative to 2007 levels. The big drop at the beginning is because of the financial crisis. Uh, my title for this slide is uh, Economics Works. <laughs> like when you make something more expensive, people buy less of it. Uh, so carbon emissions have fallen in BC, both in absolute terms and relative to Canada as a whole, maybe 10 or 15%, which is a great start, especially for a place that gets all their electricity from hydropower. We can look at, uh, uh, we can look at, at uh, the economy of British Columbia. Here's the economy of British Columbia, doing fine. Uh, and in fact, there are some studies that suggest that the tax swap has actually benefited the economy of BC, essentially by reducing the drag of the, of the tax system, right? the drag of the previous tax system. Uh, on the BC tax system. So this is a policy I'm, I'm uh, uh, proud to say that I had a very small role to play in, um, in, in the lead up to the BC carbon tax that passed in 2008. I live in Seattle now and I'm working with a group that's called Carbon Washington on bringing a BC style revenue neutral carbon tax to Washington state. So I'll tell you about that a little bit and then if you want more details I'm going to be on the panel right after lunch um, uh, that's going to go into um, a lot more about what's happening in, in different states and provinces uh, on the carbon pricing front. So uh, a little bit of political backstory. So in Washington State, we have ballot measures. So you collect, uh, you collect a bunch of signatures and you can get whatever proposal you're pushing on the ballot for people to vote on. So we have filed, a, our group, Carbon Washington, has filed a ballot measure. It's called Initiative 732. We, we have until the end of this year to collect 330,000 signatures. We are at about 260,000 signatures. Uh, and we have, a, we have a solid plan for getting on the ballot. Um, I will say that we're, we're a pretty grassrootsy group. So a lot of the, you know, the, the, the big fish didn't take us seriously, but they are beginning to take us seriously now because we have the signatures to get on the ballot, or nearly enough signatures to get on the ballot. Um, so uh, once, once we qualify, our measure actually goes to the legislature, the state legislature in January. Either they pass it, which is unlikely but possible, or it'll end up on the ballot in November of 2016. November of 2016, uh, presidential election year, the theory is that a lot of folks who care disproportionately about climate, who otherwise don't turn out to vote, uh, uh, are going to come out and vote in, in November 2016. And so that's kind of the theory for why we are aiming for November of 2016. Uh, I will tell you about our policy. It's a revenue neutral carbon tax. So the carbon tax part of it, and I'm happy to go into the details during Q&A if desired. Um, it's not typical in comedy shows to do Q&A, but... <laughs> I was told that some of you might have cues, so I should provide some A's to the cues. Uh, so the carbon tax part of it, $15 per ton of CO2 in year one, $25 per ton of CO2 in year two, going up at 3.5% plus inflation thereafter in order to maintain revenue neutrality. 
So again, $25 per ton of CO2 is about 25 cents a gallon of gasoline. It's about two and a half cents a kilowatt hour of coal-fired power, half that for natural gas, nothing for wind, solar, hydro, renewables. And so you can see that it you know, provides this nice financial incentive for utilities and households and businesses to move their buying choices in a more sustainable direction. What do we do with the money that comes out of that? And it's, a, it's about $2 billion a year, so this is a roughly 10% of the state government budget. What do we do with that money? About 70% of it goes to cut the state sales tax by a full percentage point. Okay. May or may not sound like all that much, but nickels and dimes add up over the course of the year, and this will mean uh, hundreds of dollars a year in sales tax savings for an average household in Washington State. So to a first approximation, what our policy is gonna do, if it were enacted, is that most households will end up paying a few hundred dollars a year more for fossil fuels and a few hundred dollars a year less for everything else. And that is how we are going to save the world. <laughs> that was not a laugh line. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that, because you may not think that that's much of a powerful signal, but it's a super powerful signal. So uh, we have a couple of smaller tax reductions that benefit specifically affected groups. One of those is low-income households. One of those is uh, energy-intensive manufacturers who are competing with businesses outside of the state. What we do for energy intensive manufacturers is we effectively eliminate the, the business tax in Washington State for manufacturing. So there are some complicated details I can give you about the B&O tax. It's a gross receipts tax, but basically um, uh, my favorite example of how this hopefully will work in Washington State is that there are seven food processing facilities in eastern Washington. Mostly what they do is they turn potatoes into french fries. Uh, I was actually in eastern Washington a couple weeks ago in Quincy where one of these plants is and I went to the local McDonald's because I figured I could eat local. Because <laughs> the french fries are like right there across the street. Uh, so uh, uh, these, it turns out you need a lot of natural gas to turn potatoes into french fries. Right? And so these companies, these seven facilities in eastern Washington would end up paying about $8 million a year in, our, in carbon taxes under our policy. Okay? They currently pay about $8 million a year in B&O taxes, in business taxes, on manufacturing. So the idea is swap one with the other. We're, our intent is not to raise their tax bill overall, not to put them at a competitive disadvantage relative to, to you know, other food processing facilities in other states, but to still give them a strong financial incentive to reduce emissions because every ton of emissions they reduce is gonna save them $25. What we do for low-income households, and the reason why we have a part of the policy is specifically for low-income households, like I said before, for most households, you'll end up plus or minus $100, maybe $200. For most households, that's not, you know, that's not a game-changing uh, uh, result. If you're low income, maybe losing a couple hundred dollars is a huge deal. Right, so what we do for low-income households is we fund something called the Working Families Rebate. I have to get a little wonky on you for a second. The largest anti-poverty program in the United States is something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. Uh, also a policy that's had some bipartisan support. Uh, it was greatly expanded under Ronald Reagan. It was greatly expanded under Bill Clinton. Basically, if you're low income in the US and, uh, uh, if, excuse me, if, if, if you're working in the US and you're low income, then the government sends you a check every year to top up your income, right? Up to $6,000 a year based on your income and your family structure. There are about 25 states in the US that have state level matches of the federal EITC. So basically the way that that works is that if you get $2,000 from the feds, then you get an extra $500 from the state or whatever the match happens to be. Washington State has a policy like that on the books. Passed in 2008, it's a 10% match of the federal EITC. It's never been funded. Um, so it just sits there. So we provide the funding source, namely the carbon tax, and we actually increase the match from 10% to 25% of the federal EITC. So that's gonna end up providing up to $1,500 a year for 400,000 working families in Washington state. And between that and the sales tax reduction, we think the social justice and equity um, uh, uh, status and impacts of our policy are really gonna be terrific. Uh, so that, that's all the policy is, right? And I think it's worth noting here that um, we, had a, we had a meeting with, uh, we had a meeting with, with some, some folks at a large software company in the Seattle area that will remain nameless. Uh, and, uh, there are a couple of them now, but that's okay. And uh, this company uh, actually has an, in, uh, they have an internal carbon tax, right? That they levy on their own operations and they use the revenue to sort of fund their own uh, green projects. And one of their questions was kind of like, well, where's the, where's the money for the green projects? And the answer for better or worse in our policy is that there isn't any money for green projects. 
Right? The environmental policy is the carbon tax. The carbon tax is the environmental policy. That's what's going to provide incentives for people to move in a more sustainable direction. We're not taking the money and investing it in anything. Right? We're not investing in public transit. We're not investing in clean energy. We're investing in, in tax reductions. Okay. So, uh, and we're doing that in, in large part because we want a policy that's going to that, that's going to have the potential to get to get bipartisan support. Right? We think that that. Um, we think that climate denial is not a fundamental tenet of the right side of the political spectrum, uh, but we think that smaller government is a fundamental tenet of the right side of the political spectrum, and so we're trying to keep this revenue neutral. So I'll tell you a little bit more um, uh, about kind of where things are, some things we've done, and, and then I'll put the rest of this off for, uh, for the panel, and I will go back to telling you jokes. Uh, so we worked with some folks at, at the University of Washington on a carbon tax swap calculator which you can get directly from that website there or from our campaign website, which is carbonwa.org. But basically the way this works is you enter your household income, it estimates your sales tax savings, and then you say how much do you drive and how much do you fly and how is your home heated and uh, who's your electricity provider, and it estimates your carbon tax liabilities. So I know there's a group here in Vermont that's working on, uh, working on, on a carbon tax policy. Uh, VPIRG is gonna be on, this, on, the, on the panel right after lunch. Uh, talking about that. So I think a policy like, a, a tool like this where households can, can actually see how it's gonna affect their own uh, bottom line, I think is, a, is valuable. Plus we learn all sorts of interesting things from working on this calculator. It turns out that airplanes, for example, per passenger on an airplane, airplane travel is about, uses about as much carbon emissions as driving that same distance in a Toyota Prius. So about 60 miles per gallon per passenger flying coach on an airplane. So to take an example, Seattle to New York, it's about 2,400 miles. 2,400 miles and 60 miles a gallon, it's about 40 gallons of jet fuel per person on that airplane. Okay, 40 gallons of jet fuel, our carbon tax is about 25 cents a gallon. It's about $10. So about $10 for, for a flight across the country as a result of our carbon tax. Again, may or may not sound like all that much, but, but we think that it's gonna be a, kind of a, a, a game-changing uh, policy. Uh, I will mention that, that we have interesting politics. So uh, the story that I want you to look at here is, is not the header that's about Arctic drilling and not the thing about the fish dying because waters are too hot. It's the article in the corner here that's called Green Alliance Opposes Petition to Tax Carbon, which is my vote for the uh, most ironic headline of the year. In fact, some of you may have seen Greg Mankey wrote a column about this in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. So we actually have, uh, we have some opposition from the left side of the political spectrum which has been uh, a political education for us. But uh, there's, uh, there are other folks who, who, again, for better or worse, wanna, wanna do carbon pricing, but in a way that's revenue positive, that generates revenue for investment in, uh, in clean energy projects, for investment in uh, 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 low-income communities, things like that. So more of a California-style model than our model. I think it's also fair to say this, that, that there are also folks who are more interested in a cap-and-trade approach than a carbon tax approach. There are both ways to put a price on carbon. I won't uh, 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 go into the, too many of the details, except to say that as an economist, I tend to think that, that the policies are a lot more alike than they are different. But I will give you my joke version of why I like carbon taxes better. Uh, and it's basically about comparing British Columbia and California. So British Columbia has what I think is, is the best climate policy in the world to carbon tax. Uh, with all due respect to Reggie, I think that California's cap and trade system is, is, is kind of the, the textbook example of a cap and trade system in action. Um, and uh, what I like about the BC carbon tax is that it is, is simple and transparent. So simple, in fact, that you can describe it in a haiku. Uh, I'm, so here's my haiku. I'm very proud of this. Here's my poetry. You ready? Here we go. You can count the syllables. It's a fossil CO2, $30 for each ton, revenue neutral. Ah. <sighs> And that's basically the whole policy, right? That's the whole policy. California's cap and trade system, by contrast, is a little bit more like war and peace. Okay. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad, right? War and peace is generally recognized as one of the best novels ever written, but it's complicated. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of why I like the carbon tax approach. Um, the last thing I want to show you is that $25 per ton of CO2 is actually a huge deal. So this is a national 
uh, model from the Energy Information Administration. And again, the point, I think, of doing climate policy, whether it's in Vermont or Washington State or in British Columbia, is not to, quote unquote, solve climate change in Washington State or in Vermont. The point of climate action in states is to set an example for nations and for larger bodies. Okay. So this is a national model from the Energy Information Administration. This is power sector emissions. Electricity sector emissions, which are generally recognized as kind of the lowest hanging fruit that's out there. The top, so these are power sector emissions in the US as a whole. The dark line at the top here is business as usual. And the green line here at the bottom is basically our policy adopted nationally. $25 per ton of CO2 going up slowly over time. All right, huge game changing results in terms of emissions reductions from a policy similar to ours. So uh, you occasionally get in these discussions about, well, if you had a carbon tax, how high would the carbon tax have to be to affect behavior? Certainly in the electricity sector, I would argue that something in the ballpark of $25 or $30 per ton of CO2 is, is, is a lot. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, uh, change behavior quite a bit. Uh, so um, let's see. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'll do some Q&A in a little bit if you're interested. But first, I figure I should go back to telling you some more jokes. Uh, so thank you for, for, for putting up with me for that. Uh, although I did this once for a very conservative crowd in Minnesota, and this fellow came up to me at the end and said that the stuff I said about climate change was the funniest part of my whole routine. <laughs> um, um, how much time do we have left? We have 25 minutes. 25 minutes. All right. Uh, so uh, um, let's see. I'll tell you. I, I have a couple of jokes that are not about economics that I will share with you. One of them is about Spanish, which I speak reasonably well but not perfectly. As I learned a few years ago, this was well before I was married, and I was down in Ecuador practicing my Spanish in a bar with a beautiful young woman, because economists are people too. Uh, and finally, she turned to me and she said in Spanish, she said, if you're so great, how come you're not married? And I wanted to say something sort of flirtatiously self-deprecating, you know, like, I don't know, maybe women just don't like me. <laughs> and, and what I ended up saying was, tal vez no me gustan las mujeres, which means maybe I don't like women. <laughs> when I found out what I said, I felt very embarrassada, which means, which means pregnant. <laughs> to watch out for false cognates. Uh, I also have a joke. I actually think this joke might go over pretty well in Vermont. I, uh, I struggle with it in Texas, but I have a joke about quinoa. <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you know what quinoa is? Wow. I think it's almost unanimous. Uh, for those who don't know, though, what, tell us what quinoa is. It's a grain. Right? I, actually, it's not a grain. Actually, it's a seed. I know this because the last time I did a show in New York, I said it was a grain. And this guy was like, no, it's not. You can eat it during Passover. <laughs> and I was like, look, sir, I'm just trying to do a comedy show here. Right? We don't have to like bust out the Talmud. Uh, anyway, it's a grain, it's a seed. It's okay though if you don't know, uh, it's actually a meta joke about quinoa. And the meta joke is that in most places other than Vermont, apparently it's very difficult to tell jokes about quinoa because 90% of the American public has no idea what quinoa is. And of the people who do know what quinoa is, half of them think it's pronounced quinoa. Uh, as a result, the only place I've ever been able to successfully tell jokes about quinoa is at the hippie food co-op. Because at the Hippie Food Co-op, not only does everybody know the substance named quinoa, at the Hippie Food Co-op, everybody knows a person named quinoa. <laughs> you know, they're members of the ancient grain family. Like, this is my brother Tef, my sister Amaranth. My name is Kemet, I'll be here all night. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I'm happy to say the last couple years have been big years for economics comedy. Uh, I got to be on the PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer. Uh, yeah, now I don't know how much you all know about the world of stand-up comedy, but let me just tell you this. In the world of stand-up comedy, ladies and gentlemen, it does not get any bigger <laughs> than the PBS NewsHour <laughs> with Jim Lehrer. Uh, they actually interviewed three economists on this show. They interviewed uh, Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize. They interviewed Joseph Stiglitz who won the Nobel Prize, and they interviewed me. Uh, I felt like kind of a self-aware version of Donald Trump. <laughs> and what did they ask me? My moment of TV fame when the PBS News Hour, they asked me if I'd ever bombed on stage. All right, now a couple of things about this, okay? First of all, 
I am not afraid of failure. Right? I'm an economist. <laughs> Secondly, I'm a professional comedian, right? So if a joke doesn't work, you just sort of keep throwing stuff out there until you find something that sticks, which is basically the same thing that the Fed and the Treasury did for the last six or seven years. <laughs> Finally, I had to admit on the PBS NewsHour that in fact I had bombed on stage. The worst show I ever did was in October of 2008. You, you remember what was happening to the world economy and the stock market in October of 2008? Looked like we were going back into the Great Depression, right? October of 2008, I did a show in Colorado Springs for a group of bankers. <laughs> and, and they were not happy campers. And let me just tell you, comedy is kind of a violent business, right? Like if you're doing well, then you're killing. And if you're doing badly, then you're bombing. Uh, and I totally bombed that show. And I actually did so poorly, I spent a fair amount of time afterwards sort of soul searching, like trying to figure out where had I lost the connection with this audience of bankers in Colorado Springs in October of 2008. And I finally realized that I lost them on my opening line. And my opening line was, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Apparently, it wasn't going very well. Uh, I'll mention I've got a couple of cartoon economics books. Uh, they're super fun. You can get them on Amazon. I have a couple copies that I brought with me. Uh, uh, I'm happy to say economists said nice things about them. Oh, I'll show you some slides. Here's John Nash saying, uh, these, we have these, some slides about what people won the Nobel Prize for. So John Nash won for game theory. He's saying, um, uh, I figured out an optimal strategy for rock, paper, scissors. And the King of Sweden says, congratulations to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz is saying, sometimes the invisible hand is invisible because it's not there. <laughs> Which is actually a classic Stiglitz line. And then the Nobel Prize in economics is going to be announced on Monday. And there's a reasonable chance that Marty Weitzman, possibly also with Bill Nordhaus at Yale, will win for environmental economics for kind of Marty Weitzman in particular did work on uh, comparing cap and trade systems and carbon taxes back in the 70s. So the general idea being that the way to get less pollution is to make polluting expensive. Uh, so those are the books. I'm happy to say econ some economists have said nice things about them. So Greg Mankiw called it a painless way to learn economics, <laughs> which I thought was especially generous coming from Greg Mankiw given what I said about his book. <laughs> I mean, I really think the only thing that I could have done that would have been meaner to Greg Mankiw would have been to post something on my blog calling his book a painful way to learn economics. <laughs> Um, which, which I didn't do. Uh, anyway, and I have a, a new book out. Uh, this is our third book uh, uh, called The Cartoon Introduction to Climate Change. So there's a good chapter on carbon pricing in that. I hope you will check it out. And again, I have, uh, I have some copies that are, that are available. Um, that's how to get a hold of me. Uh, I also, if you've got a business card, you want to be on my email list, uh, please give me your business card. I won't spam you, but I'll let you know when I have shows coming up our new videos that are coming out. Every year, for example, I run the humor session at the annual meeting of the American Economic Association. <laughs> and you are all invited. Uh, it's always in early January. Uh, it's in Boston and New York uh, uh, a fair amount of the time. This coming year, it's going to be in San Francisco. And you know, if you or anybody you know is interested in economics, I encourage you to come to the whole thing. Uh, it's really just an amazing conference, um, amazing event. It's like 10,000 economists from all over the world who converge on one city for a long weekend, and it's just wild. <laughs> Let me stop there and see if there are any questions, and if there aren't, I'll tell you some more jokes. So questions about comedy, about climate change, about Washington State climate policy, carbon taxes? Well, first of all, hang on one second. First of all, you can give me a round of applause. Thank you. And then we'll go down there back. All right. Gentlemen in the back. Well, I'm from Seattle, and Bernie had an experience in Seattle that you may have heard of. Um, what I can tell you, to be perfectly honest, is um, uh, I have a paying job doing stand-up comedy about economics. I have a full-time unpaid job working on this carbon tax campaign, and I have a 14-month-old baby at home. And the election is like a, a year and a half from now. I, so I've, I've really not paid attention. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, the, I'm, not your Bernie, I'm not your Bernie Sanders tea leaver, tea, tea leave reader. I'm the, swing, I'm the swing voter. That's correct. That is correct. I am the swing voter. Uh, other questions? Yeah. As an economist, I don't know how much of a hand you personally had in designing the Washington proposal versus just promoting it, but I wonder if you weren't tempted to make it high enough to reflect the actual social cost of carbon. So, um, did everybody hear the question? 
So the question was about what, how much was I involved in the policy and does it, to, how come it's not higher to reflect the actual social cost of carbon? So I, I've been pretty heavily involved in, in all aspects of the policy. I, I was, um, I'm not a lawyer, but, but uh, uh, I've, been, I've been involved since, since the beginning on the campaign. Um, my view of it is that, um, so the reference was to the social cost of carbon, which is if you look at economics, literature, it sort of says, well, what's the correct price to correct the market failure to internalize the externality? And uh, estimates of that, of this social cost of carbon, are all over the board from negative numbers to like thousands of dollars. I actually think that the central estimate, if you look at what the US government uses, the central estimate is actually pretty close to $30 per ton of CO2. So. Um, so that was, that was one reason we ended up at $30 per ton of CO2. The second reason we ended up at about $30 per ton of CO2 is that we're, that's where British Columbia is and they're right next door. And so that, that, was, uh, that was kind of a, um, a focal point. And I, I think a, a third thing was um, I would worry about doing state level policy that gets too far out of line from the rest of the country, the rest of North America, uh, especially if you look at impacts on manufacturing. Um, uh, and thir so $30 per ton of CO2 seemed to be kind of a sweet spot for that. And a final point was just that we were looking for something that would reduce, we could reduce the sales tax by a point with our $25 carbon tax, and that seemed like a, like a, like a good target. So, uh, yes, sir. As the uh, carbon tax works, revenues go down, it gets replaced with all of the other taxes. So the question was about rev revenue neutrality over time because the, if the carbon tax works, it's going to reduce uh, it's going to reduce revenue. So we actually have that built into our model. So we assume two percent annual reductions in carbon emissions. So that means that Washington State carbon emissions are going to are going to cut, get cut in half every thirty five years. Um, so we build in a, the that's why the carbon tax rate goes up over time. The carbon tax rate goes up at three and a half percent plus inflation, and that's to account for carbon reductions plus growth in in uh, in, in GDP, and we're basically trying to, if you, if you think about the sales tax reduction as a hole in the government coffers, right, that hole is getting bigger over time, and then you think about carbon tax revenue, and the base of that carbon tax, as you say, is going to decline over time, but we're increasing the rate enough that, 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 that we're going to do our best to maintain revenue neutrality over time. But you're right that that's a, that's, that's a, that's a key question, um, and trying to do revenue neutral is actually like you're walking the... You were walking the ridge line, you might say, right, with folks on one side saying that they don't want it to be revenue positive and folks on the other side saying they don't want it to be revenue negative. Uh, in the back, woman in the back. Or, sorry, sir, in the back. No, no, go ahead, sir. Yeah. It seems that your carbon tax would be a bit regressive. Could you comment? Uh, question was, is the, is the carbon tax regressive by itself? It, it would be regressive. Low-income households pay more of their income in, for fossil fuels than higher-income households do. But we cut the sales tax, which is also regressive, and then we fund this working families rebate. Uh, so our analysis is actually that our policy is going to be the biggest step forward in terms of progressivity of the Washington state tax system since the 1977 ballot measure that eliminated the sales tax on food. Uh, so we're, we're quite proud of the social justice aspects of our policy. Yes. Sure. So the question was about whether or not um, the BC experience is going to continue. It looks like carbon emissions have sort of started to rise again a little bit. I wouldn't put too much uh, uh, emphasis on one year just because the data is, the, you know, the data moves around. Um, uh, I mean, one, there, are, there are lots of interesting things, and part of this is learning by doing. So for example, economists talk about what's called elasticity of demand, basically how price responsive are consumers. And estimates for motor gasoline and petroleum tend to be very inelastic. Right? People don't respond very strongly to price changes. But what happened in British Columbia, and there are a couple of papers about this, is that um, the actual results that they saw in British Columbia in terms of price elasticities were seven times greater than the models estimate. And there are sort of stories they tell you about behavioral economics. And my favorite story is that this was on the front page of the paper in, in, in British Columbia for like a year. And so people kind of look at that and they're like, hey, maybe I should buy a more fuel efficient car. Uh, so uh, lots of interesting story there. And, and I think to, to a large extent, my answer is we're, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, maybe a couple more questions. Gentlemen here, yes. How are you building conservative and business support for the campaign? How are we building conservative and business support for the campaign? Uh, great question. 
uh, we did our best to talk to everybody that we could when we designed the policy. And we thought pretty hard about impacts on businesses. The, um, we're fortunate that we have some bipartisan support on the campaign. So uh, we have an endorsement from Ron Sims, who is the former uh, King County executive, which includes Seattle. Very liberal, progressive fellow, ran on an income tax platform a couple years ago. And that was kind of the end of his political career. Uh, we don't have income taxes in Washington State. Um, we also have an endorsement, in fact, a, a fellow sits on our advisory board named Bill Finkbeiner, who was the former, he was a Republican legislator representing Kirkland, which is not far from, uh, not far from Seattle, and also a name you may have seen at Costco, <laughs> uh, which is based in the area. Uh, so he, he's a re, he was a Republican representative from Kirkland in the state legislature for 12 years, was the Senate Majority Leader. So he's on our, uh, um, on our executive committee. But, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I mean, what I'll honestly tell you is that is that um, it's hard. I, I think there, the opportunity is that there are a lot of folks on the right side of the political spectrum that are coming around on climate science and realizing that whether or not they, even whether or not they believe in climate science, that climate action is coming, like some sort of policy is coming, and that saying no is no longer just a, is no longer a viable path. So what we're trying to convince them of is that this is a business-friendly, market-friendly, conservative-friendly policy that they can get behind. We have a fair amount of support nationally um, for this idea. Like you read Greg Mankiw's column, he was the chair of economic advisors for George W. Bush. You know, so he was a pretty conservative economist. He loves revenue neutral carbon taxes. Um, uh, Bob Inglis has got this great group called the Energy and Enterprise Initiative uh, working on climate action from a right of center perspective. And a lot of their energies focus on this idea of revenue neutral carbon taxes. Um, but uh, one of the things that we found in this campaign is that by trying to do something that's bipartisan, we kind of end up getting attacked by everybody. Um, so that, that's life. Yes, sir. Um, on the issue of that uh, revenue neutral, and what I'm curious about, did you give some thought about at least pulling off a small sliver to go back into helping people actually reduce their use of carbon through, let's say, improving efficiency? And I'm thinking particularly low income people, because you know, price signals are nuts, but their ability to actually do something about it is clearly limited. What thought was there to, because I know that's one of the issues that we're, we're facing here about 100% revenue neutral versus. Yep, so the question was about to what extent did we go for 100% revenue neutral versus something more like what the folks who are working on this in Vermont are working on, which is like 90% revenue neutral plus 10% for investments, especially for energy efficiency, low income households. Um, uh, I'll say a couple things about this. One is that um, uh, as a philosophical matter, I think there's a there's 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 kind of a, it's kind of a qualitative issue for many people on the right side of the political spectrum rather than a quantitative issue. So whether it's 90% revenue neutral or 99% revenue neutral, that just doesn't get you the same uh, mileage as 100% revenue neutral. Uh, so that's one point to keep in mind. Second point is uh, I don't doubt that those policies are, are potentially valuable, but I, I worry about the extent to which you can actually target them at low-income households. For example, if you do weatherization projects for, for, uh, uh, for low-income households, then how do you know that those, um, that those benefits aren't going to be captured by landlords, for example? And um, so I guess I worry, I worry about the devil in the details in a lot of those policies. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, like I come from, I'm a, as an economist, I'm a pretty neoclassical economist. Like you don't need to, uh, I don't have any, I love the Gund Institute, but you don't need to be like a, a, an ecological economist um, uh, to, to believe that there are you know, environmental externalities and that we should internalize them with something like a carbon tax. So, um, so my, my free market instincts sort of lead me to say, let's push the private sector to take care of it. At the same time, I mean, I recognize you know, that there are, um, there are challenges that, that smart policy could, could address down the road. And, um, uh, you know, the, I think a, a speaker on one of the previous sessions said, said that, of course, there's no silver bullet. I think a carbon tax is actually pretty close to a silver bullet. Uh, but I recognize that, that it may not be the end all and be all. Yes, sir. Ideas as to how to backfill that loss of income to keep our bridges from falling 
Yeah, so the question was about how a carbon tax is not going to help with the transportation funding issues that many states, including New Hampshire, Washington State, has actually seen this as well, where people are driving less, they're driving more fuel efficient vehicles, and so the money that goes into the highway fund goes down, but the amount of money you need to maintain roads and bridges does not go down, and so where is that, where is that funding source going to come from? And he asked me whether I had any good ideas for addressing this issue, and my answer is no. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what I, here's, I mean, here's what I'll say about that, to be, to be perfectly honest. I mean, Washington State has a huge transportation funding shortfall. They actually just passed a gas tax increase. Unfortunately, in my view, they dedicated a lot of the gas tax increase to building more roads. Uh, so what I, in, instead, instead of maintenance. So um, here's what I'll say, and this gets back to the gentleman's earlier question about revenue neutrality over time. I think we are pretty confident that in the short run, like in the one or two decade perspective, we're going to be pretty close to revenue neutral. I can't guarantee it, but there's a, we have a very good shot at being pretty close to revenue neutral because whether we like it or not, we're not going to get off of fossil fuels uh, anytime soon. Like it's going to be a multi-decade transition, and uh, that's my view anyway. And so we have a pretty good idea of, of what's going to happen in the next decade or two. I think if you're asking a question about a 40 or 50 year time horizon, then yes, there are questions about revenue neutrality in that time horizon. And uh, my answer to you is basically that the carbon tax is not going to help those discussions, but we're not central to those discussions, right? In the, in the next 40 or 50 years, we're probably gonna electrify the transportation system. And so we're gonna have to do something new in terms of how do we fund roads and bridges. And uh, my optimistic view of this is that, well, first of all, it'd be pretty great if we like solve climate change, like that'd be awesome. Uh, and secondly, you know, in a, in a 50 or 100 year time frame, tax systems change, like they have to change. The first gas tax in the nation, anybody know this? First gas tax in the nation? Uh, Oregon in 1919, uh, the first gas tax in the nation. So 100 years ago, there were no gas taxes. Right, 100 years from now, there will probably be no gas taxes. And so that transition, whether it's mileage fees, VMT fees, um, uh, road usage, usage charges, you know, that stuff's all up for discussion. Um, but but we have we have some time to figure that out. Any other questions? Should I tell a couple more jokes? Are we done? We're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic.